Identifying a tree can be a challenge for even the most experienced master gardener. In order to be successful, one must use all the identifying features available, including the leaves, twigs and buds, thorns, fruit and flowers, tree form or shape, and in some cases, the site location of the plant. During winter and spring of 2022, OSU Extension in Fairfield County hosted a virtual Master Gardener training. On March 17th, Kathy Smith, OSU Extension Program Director for the Ohio Woodland Stewards Program, was featured presenter speaking on considerations when identifying trees and woody ornamentals in the landscape and environment. Listen in as Kathy begins her presentation. So there's a lot of things you can use and it depends on the season of when you're gonna to try to ID a plant. And so in this image that we've got here, we have bark, we have leaves and we have flowers that we can use all for this one tree. Um, and it helps the more clues that you can work from, but realize that if you were trying to ID this tree this time of year, you're not gonna have the flowers and you're not gonna have the leaves. So I typically tell folks, if you really haven't focused on doing tree ID, start when the leaves are out. It's a little simpler to kind of make some connections to the tree when you have a leaf to work with. We'll talk about twigs and buds. Um, that's more of a winter ID. And I always tell folks, man, do not start with winter ID because you'll get frustrated and just not want to follow through. Thorns, fruit and flowers, the form or the shape of the tree. We'll look at some of those. Location. Now location only matters when you're looking at trees that are native to an area. If they're trees that somebody has planted, all bets are off on location being able to help you. And a prime example is in my own yard. I have a pin oak and I have a swamp white oak, both which would be considered wet site trees, um, but they're growing in my yard, which is not a swamp or a stream area. Um, so it's once you, you plant them somewhere, um, the location part of ID just doesn't help. So let's start and look quickly at leaves. And it's always good to know what is a leaf because many times I have master gardeners who have someone who brings a sample in and they haven't brought enough of the plant in to help us ID it. So realize that a leaf is attached to the twig um, where the bud for next year's growth is situated. So you can kind of see here, um, this is a bud for next year's growth and this is a bud. Um, and then what's growing beneath that bud, that's a leaf. And so you need to be able to make that distinction. And if they only bring you a leaf, you may be able to identify it if they only bring you a leaflet from like a compound leaf, and we'll look at that in a minute, you're probably not going to be able to identify it. So I always try to get master gardeners when they're dealing with samples for folks, get a little bit of the twig so we can see what the branching pattern is, where the buds are, what the buds look like. Um, all of that can play into helping us being successful at IDing the tree. So when we do, we have a day long tree ID class that we do, um, we used to do <laughs> out and about, and hopefully we will get back to doing those across the state this year. Um, so, you know, you start with what kind of tree is it? Is it broadleaf that has leaves that fall off in the fall? Um, or is it a conifer that has some kind of needle or scale or something along those lines that some folks would classify as evergreen? But not all conifers are evergreen, meaning that they don't all keep their needles year round. And we'll look at some examples of that as well. So that's kind of your first question when you're looking at a tree to ID, which one is it? Is it a broadleaf that loses its leaves or is it a conifer that has needles or scales instead of leaves like you see on the broad leaves? The next question you wanna ask is what your leaf and twig arrangement is. So do they alternate in that there's one on the right hand side and if you go farther up the twig, the next one is off the left. Are they opposite? They come out on that twig opposite each other 
or are they whirled where there's three coming off of one um, specific point? And this is for broad leaves. So broad leaf or conifer, you say it's a broad leaf, opposite, alternate, or whirled, and pick which one um, you want to look at. So if I look at this one, you can see how it alternates down the twig. And so this would be an alternately branched because those buds are next year's growth. And so they alternate from side to side. The leaves are attached alternately. Um, they are a simple leaf in one um, leaf blade. And we'll look at some of those examples as well. But for your knowledge, this is American chestnut, something we don't see very often. Here's one that is opposite. So the leaves are attached opposite, the buds are opposite, um, and this is one of our ashes. And so they fall into that category. There's a handful that we call mad buck that are opposite and the ashes are part of that group. And then here we have that world. So there's one leaf coming off here, one towards the back, one over here to the side, three at one point. Um, and this is actually Northern Catalpa, which is one of the few tree species that we have um, that is world when you talk about the branch arrangement or the twig arrangement um, or the bud arrangement. So then we have to kind of look at what kind of leaves are we talking about. So if you start on the left hand side, you know, this whole thing is a leaf. This is a simple blade. It would be attached towards the base of the petiole here. Um, where it would be attached to the twig with the bud for next year's growth. If you move over um, at the top on the right hand side, that whole thing is a leaf and would be attached at the base here with a bud for next year's growth. Um, and this one, instead of being the simple leaf that the first one was, this is called a bipinnately compound leaf um, or a twice pinnately compound leaf because this whole thing is a leaf. Moving down in this right hand, lower right hand corner, these are palmately compound leaves and five, six, seven leaflets usually between the species that have palmately compound. Um, they originate from one point and they would still be attached to the twig at the base. And last but not least is just pinnately compound. And so when you have pinnately palmately and bipinnately compound leaves. You have lots of leaflets. And this is where I tell you that if someone brings you in one of these leaflets, it's gonna be really hard to tell what the identity of that tree is. So you need the whole leaf. It'd be great if you had some of the twig that that leaf was attached to as well for more clues. So a little more detail, here's a simple leaf. Um, some common terminology uh, that we um, see with the leaf margins, the leaf blade, the petiole on a simple leaf. And usually you don't have to get to the ID point of a leaf tip, but if you do, there's a lot of different shapes for leaf tips as well to help ID trees. So here's a simple leaf. And this one, when we talk about leaf margins, um, we talk about this one as toothed or serrate. Um, this one is actually has teeth on teeth. So if you look, there's a big tooth and on that big tooth, there's some little teeth. Here's a big tooth and there's multiple little teeth on that. So this is a simple leaf. It's actually one of our elms. Um, down here's the bud for next year's growth, and then this entire structure is the leaf. Here's another simple leaf. This is a white oak. Um, a lot of times you'll see books talk about lobes or sinuses, and so these are rounded lobes, and sinuses are these dips in between those lobes. Some are more prominent than others, and that can be a huge ID characteristic when you're looking at the oaks. Here's another one that has lobes, um, and the leaf margin or the leaf edge has teeth, has these lovely little 
spiky balls in the fall that no one wants to walk in their yard barefoot when they're on the ground. So this is sweet gum. Um, so again, number of lobes on this, here's a lobe, here's a lobe, a main lobe, and another couple over here. So you're looking at five lobes, you're looking at teeth on the margin. In this case, if you've got the spiky fruit, you're gonna be able to ID it without anything else. Pinately compound leaves, um, when we first encountered emerald ash borer, one of the first fact sheets that we did was how to know if your tree was an ash. And to tell the ashes apart, you need to know the number of leaflets. So in this case, the one on the right hand side is an ash and you have two, four, six, you have seven leaflets. So a lot of times um, the keys may say seven to 11. Um, but it puts you in the ballpark for which ash species it is. This is actually um, green. On the left-hand side is another pinnately compound leaf, but this is one of the hickories. So again, number of leaflets, what does that terminal leaflet look like? Um, what are the leaf margins like? There's a lot of clues that can come off of this, but it's not gonna happen if they only bring you one of those leaflets. You need that whole leaf in both of these cases. A little bit more detail um, on a pinnately compound leaf. So you have two, four, and five leaflets on this one. Um, the rachis is the center point where the leaves, the leaflets are attached. Um, and so number of leaflets, what they look like attached to the rachis, um, all of that plays a role in being able to properly identify some of our hardwood trees. And then the bipinnately compound leaf that I was talking about in the um, drawings. So this is all one leaf that you're looking at here and all these little leaflets. Um, this is Kentucky coffee tree and it's one of our two bipinnately or twice pinnately compound leaves. Um, you'll have number of leaflets, but in this case, because it's bipinnately compound, you really are looking at either Kentucky coffee tree or honey locust. Um, and honey locust can have both pinnately compound and bipinnately compound leaves. Um, so if you find a bipinnately or a twice pinnately compound leaf, um, most of our trees we're talking about are either Kentucky coffee tree or um, honey locust. Okay, and here's the honey locust version of a bipinnately compound leaf. Um, so again, multiple leaflets. This whole thing is a leaf um, and it can be confusing on honey locust because you will have both bipinnately and just pinnately compound leaves. Palmately compound leaves are typically the buckeyes and the horse chestnuts. So you have Ohio buckeye, yellow buckeye and red buckeye all have pinnately compound leaves that have somewhat similar shapes. Um, we usually joke and say that um, yellow buckeye has five, usually mostly six leaflets, whereas Ohio buckeye is usually dominated by leaves that are five leaflet and occasionally a six. Makes them hard to tell apart just by the leaves. So you'd like to have the fruit and we will look at some fruit later on in the presentation. But then the one here on the upper right is um, horse chestnut. They typically have seven leaflets coming off of that. And you can see these points at the end of the leaflets are very different than they are on the Buckeyes. And horse chestnut actually is not native. And some states have it on their invasive species list, but I can honestly say I've never seen a horse chestnut pop up in the woods like I've seen some other species that tend to leave the landscape and end up in our natural areas. Here's a red buckeye. So again, kind of that standard buckeye look. Um, the rachis has more of a red tint to it, but typically five leaflets. Um, and the fruit looks very different as well. So let's talk about one small group. If you ask um, deciduous or conifer and you say, 
oh, you know, it's a deciduous tree, it loses its leaves. And then you do the opposite alternate or world and you say opposite, you're looking at a small category of trees that fall under the mad buck listing. Maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeye or horse chestnut falls into there as well. And so you've taken, you know, a couple hundred tree species and you've now narrowed it down with a few questions um, into the smaller category of trees. So if you start at the upper left, um, you're looking at sugar maple and then move to your right, you're looking at red maple. So very different looking leaves. Um, red maple has teeth on the leaf margins. Uh, sugar maple does not. Number of lobes, um, teeth, all of that plays into some key characteristics. Now, if you move to the bottom row, um, you have flowering dogwood on the left, you have red buckeye in the middle, and you have um, green ash out on the, the right. So all part of that mad buck. Um, you know, in the dogwood side, you also have a lot of the shrubby dogwoods. There are definitely more maples than the two I show here. Um, we will look at some additional species, but this is all about mad buck, the handful that you've eliminated down to, to make ID a little bit easier. So when we talk about some of these species, if you look at the sugar maple, you can see opposite buds on the left-hand side, um, little helicopter, helicopter looking fruit in the center, um, usually is also paired and if you want to use fruit, there's a great um, fruit key out there that's been around since the 40s, black and white drawings, but it's probably one of the best when you start trying to key by fruit. And you can tell the maples apart by their fruit and how those two sides are joined, what that joint looks like. Um, but then on the right, you can see the typical, what we think about as a sugar maple leaf. Silver maple, um, still opposite. Little helicopters, these aren't quite as mature as they were in the other photo, the sugar maple photo. Um, but then you look at the leaf, you've got teeth on the leaf margins, you have pretty deep sinuses. And for a true silver maple, the back of the leaf has a little bit of a silver color to it. Red maple, there's a couple versions here of a red maple leaf, but you can see we still have the paired fruit. We still have opposite in the buds when we look at the twigs. Um, and what you need to know is that red and silver can cross and create a hybrid, which is sold in the nurseries as Acer Fremonti or Autumn Blades. And then there's one that always has to ruin, you know, all the same characteristics. We have box elder. So it is an Acer. Um, it is in the maple family. And it doesn't have just a simple leaf blade. It's got a pinnately compound leaf with typically three to five leaflets. Fruit is still a paired Samara and the buds still are opposite. So similarities, but the leaves are the ones that are really different for box elder. Um, but it is Acer. When you look at the Latin name, it's Acer Nagundo. Then we switch to the ash. So this would be white ash, our upland species. Buds paired, pinnately compound leaflet, um, fruit that looks kind of ore like. You can tell the ash apart by the fruit, but um, it's probably the last option you want to use if you're trying to, you know, ID them out. And then we have the dogwoods. As I said, we have flowering dogwood, um, simple leaves, beautiful flowers in the spring. Here's a flower bud just waiting for the next year. But you can see everything's still paired as in the mad buck group. Um, and one of the caveats I always try to stress to folks is that the white flowering um, dogwood that is native, when you look at where it survives and thrives the best, it is on the edge of the woods. So it gets early, more. typically it'll get early morning sunlight, um, but the hot afternoon sunlight, it's usually protected from. So if you're gonna put one in the landscape, think about that. Think about, it may not be a happy camper if it gets put out in the front lawn with nothing to protect it. Um, you might wanna put it on the side of the house where it gets partial shade, a little bit of protection from that late afternoon heat. 
the Buckeyes. So Ohio and yellow are the most prominent species in the state when we talk about the Buckeyes. And you can kind of see here, buds are still paired, but the difference comes in the fruit. So Ohio Buckeye has that very spiny shell, usually has one, maybe two, upwards of three, but three is a little unusual for what they have in that shell. And then the lower one has a smooth shell, a little bit bigger fruit, and can have upwards of five buckeyes in that shell. So Ohio buckeye has the spiny shell and yellow buckeye has the smooth shell. Buckeyes or horse chestnuts. Um, these are some horse chestnuts. Now I'm, I'm gonna kind of, if you start at the left-hand side, that's actually a tree I have in the yard that is an Ohio buckeye horse chestnut hybrid. Um, has the very sticky bud like you think of with horse chestnut, a resinous bud, still opposite. Its leaves look more like buckeyes than horse chestnut, um, but it's one of those, it has a pink bloom on it in the spring and has never produced fruit in the almost 20 years. So it, it blooms, but um, it has been pretty sterile as far as I can tell. In the center, you see kind of the, the typical horse chestnut um, leaf. Fruit are usually pretty large and the shells are spiny like Ohio, but the spines are usually larger as well. A much more prickly looking outer shell. And the fruit is just huge when compared to the two Buckeyes. So if you go to an Ohio State game and somebody is selling Buckeye necklaces and they're large, Buckeyes, they probably are horse chestnuts and not Buckeyes, um, but they probably don't want to have you say that to them. When we talk about the world branching, you had opposite, you had alternate and world, we talked, it's Northern Catalpa, kind of this heart shaped looking leaf. One of the last trees to bloom in the spring. So you think all the trees are done blooming and then you're driving around and you see these trees that have these huge, almost orchid-like blooms on them, um, those would be the catalpas. And so you're going to have three leaf scars, three buds um, that work around that twig. And there's some of the flowers. And then, of course, this time of year, all that's left are those cigar-shaped seed pods hanging from the tree, which are also pretty um, easily used to ID what tree you're looking at. But the blooms are gorgeous in the spring. Um, but like I said, they're typically the last tree to bloom in the spring. Um, and there may be a gap, quite a bit of a gap between the time you see these flowers and the time you've seen what you thought was the last trees that were flowering in the spring. So if we take those opposites, you've got that small group that we've kind of isolated. And we move into the alternates because world, we just talked about the one species we typically see. So everything else falls into alternate and we got to figure out ways that we're going to cut those down when it comes to ID. Um, oaks typically have a cluster of buds at the tip of the twig and rounded lobes are for the white oaks and pointed with bristle hairs are the red oaks. And we'll look at some examples here. So on the left, Swamp white oak, rounded lobes, um, not deep sinuses. And then on the right, you can see the bristle hairs at the tip. And that is very indicative of a tree that falls into the category of red oaks. They have this cluster of buds at the tip. And this would go with um, a white oak, a traditional white oak, not the swamp white oak. Um, and so you, you look here and there's like one, two, three, four, there's at least five buds sitting at this tip. You can have more than that sometimes, um, but it's one of the few tree species that has this cluster of buds at the tip. So we're gonna just ID some that are in the, the two categories. So for the white oaks, you have rounded lobes, your acorns mature in one year, which means if it blooms this spring, It'll produce an acorn that will drop next fall and put out a root radical and start growing. So you have one growing season for acorns that sit on a white oak species. And some of them in this group would be the traditional white oak, swamp white oak, bur oak, chinkapin oak, and post oak. 
There are others we could add, but those are probably the more common ones we see in Ohio. So a quick tour through some of those. Um, white oak, and I want you to note the difference between the leaves in this upper right-hand corner image and the bigger one at the bottom. The difference is due to the amount of sunlight. So the bottom white oak leaf is an understory leaf, which means it needs to have more leaf surface in order to capture the same amount of sunlight that the other image, those smaller, deeper lobed leaves are from the top of the tree. And so they get full sun, they don't need a lot of leaf surface to compensate for everything. Um, so when you're doing tree ID, you need to keep that in mind. If I'm looking at leaves that are at my height, more than likely they're a little bit bigger than normal because they're lower um, kind of understory or shade leaves. And you need to keep that in mind because ID may talk about size and depth of sinuses and you need to compensate for that change in location and sunlight. Swamp white oak, um, a little different when you think about its Latin name, which is Quercus bicolor. So when you look at the leaf, the upper surface is typically this dark green. And if you flip it over, it has a white kind of fuzzy texture to it. So two different colors, that's where the bicolor comes from. You still have this cluster of buds at the tip. Um, and in this case, you have acorns that are not directly attached to the twig. They have this little stem called a peduncle that attaches them to the twigs, which makes them very different than the rest of our native acorns. Burr oak. Um, I love the texture of burr oak when you're looking in the winter. Um, you've got a lot of corky ridges that, you know, they're not just smooth twigs or the bark isn't a smooth bark. Um, you still have a cluster of buds. You have an acorn with a hairy cap that's going to cover half to two thirds of the acorn itself and directly attached to the stem. And then a leaf that is a little bit mitten shaped at the top. And then we'll have some deep sinuses and then the rest of the leaf gradually um, branches out. So when we look at the group that's called red oaks, um, there's the bristle hairs that we wanna look for. That's the key distinction when you're looking between the two oaks. If you've got a bristle hair, it falls in the red side of things. Northern red, black, pin, shingle. Um, there's other ones that fall into those categories. But red oak acorns take two years to mature. So flower this spring, produce an acorn. It's gonna sit there as a tiny acorn all summer, all through the fall and winter. And then next spring of 2023, it'll start to fill out to be a full-sized acorn. It will go through the growing season into the fall. And then the next spring is when it'll start putting a root radical out. And so it's two full years um, that those acorns are on the tree and takes them two years to mature. So you would always like to have a combo of the two. Northern red, you can kind of see you still have the cluster of buds. You can see the bristle hairs. Acorns are decent sized and they have a cap that looks kind of like a beret that just is sitting on the top of the acorn. Um, fairly large sized acorn when it comes to the acorns that we look at. Pin oak, lots of deep sinuses, small acorns, but still has the bristle hairs at the tip and multiple buds at the tip of the twig. So the bristle hairs are still there and then multiple buds at the end of the twig, but a very small acorn um, when, it talk, when you talk about size. Shingle oak is the one that breaks the rules. You still have a cluster of buds, you have acorns. Um, and in this case, you have one sitting here that I, you know, without being able to see the real twig, um, it could very well be an acorn waiting for the next season, or it could be just one that didn't um, fill out for the year. And then shingle oak don't have lobes, but it has a bristle hair down here at the very tip. Um, so 
that's one of the things you want to look for because in this case you know the the lobes and the sinuses are not going to be there but you'll have acorns and so if you have acorns and you got to go look at the leaf a little closer and see which one you're looking at We'll spend a little bit of time on conifers. Um, white pine is a pretty well-planted species across the state. There was a point in time where recommendations to plant white pine went out for every soil type in the state, which was not a good thing. Uh, we planted white pine on soils that it never should have been growing on, but it's a pine and so its um, needles are in these bundles. So if you look, it's all bundled into one package. And for white pine, there's five needles in a bundle. There's five letters in white. If you wanna make that distinction to help you remember, um, long needles, very soft, heavily used as a Christmas tree, but not if you have heavy ornaments because they're just gonna slide right off. The limbs are gonna bend and the ornaments are gonna fall off. A decent tree on the right side, but will definitely not grow everywhere. Northern white cedar, which in the commercial nursery trade is arborvitae, has these scales instead of needles. And um, you can see all of them on here. So northern white cedar is the native version for arborvitae. And if you're familiar with um, places like Cedar Bog, in Champaign County, that's a native growing, a native area of growth for northern white cedar. Um, and so the nursery trade has taken it um, because it's tolerant of wet sites, it can tolerate some really bad um, site conditions and has been made into um, a multifaceted uh, operation when it comes to how many varieties of arborvitae are out there. But the native is northern white cedar we have a couple of patches of native northern white cedar spread across the state. For conifers, you also may want to use cones. So in this case, this is Virginia pine. If you look at the bundle of needles, there's two in the bundle. They have a little bit of a twist to them. And traditionally, Virginia pine has kind of a yellow green color to it. And it has these cones that we would say are armed because they have these spikes on the bottom and the cone hangs kind of upside down. For some tree species in the conifer family, um, those cones will stand upright and maybe they won't have the armor on them that this Virginia pine has. So those all play roles when we start talking about ID for ornamentals and natives. And we have the single needle, short needle pines or conifers, I should say, because they're not pines, they're spruces in this case. Um, this is from a blue spruce and individually attached. In this case, this spruce does have a little bit of a blue color to it, but not all blue spruce are blue. Um, some of the varieties are very green or they may just be blue when the new growth comes out. Um, so you need to understand the variety of spruce that you're looking at. Then there's hemlock, um, which is one of our native trees that we have, unfortunately, uh, very susceptible to hemlock woolly adelgid. You have old cones on this species here, or this plant specimen here, and new cones, um, what we call two ranked. So if you laid it flat on a piece of paper, you know, the needles would be out from each other. There's little stripes on the underside of the needles, but natively hemlock grows in kind of groves in um, special areas, special soils. They don't grow everywhere in the state of Ohio, but we have pockets that are native. Um, and unfortunately, as I said, all of them are susceptible to hemlock woolly adelgid, which is in many of our populations in Ohio. Then you have the firs, which are usually much softer needles. Um, none of them are native, but you're used to seeing white fir, uh, Douglas fir, which is not a true fir, 
um, balsam fir, canane fir. So they all have kind of soft needles individually attached, just like the um, spruces are. So again, kind of have to know what you're looking at, feel them, you know, grab a hold. The, the spruces are going to be a little spiny. The firs are going to be much softer to the touch. And then we have the other native that just kind of blows the rules out the window. So this is larch or tamarack needles grown out of those nice little stubs that you see there on the twigs, but a deciduous conifer loses its needles in the winter um, and then regrows come spring. Um, so not something that stays green all year round, but is still considered a conifer um, because of its um, seed form as a gymnosperm, a naked seed. So we'll flip into twigs and buds. Um, and there's some terminology here that we need to focus on at least a little bit. Terminal buds, um, leaf scars. So this is where the leaf was attached and it leaves a scar behind. And for some species, a very distinctive scar that can be part of the ID process, just depends on the species. Lentisols, you know, the little white spots that you see there that are breathing apparatus for the tree. Lateral buds, again, down from that terminal bud. And not everybody has a terminal bud. We'll look at some that don't have. They have what we call a false terminal bud. Um, but inside the leaf scar are little dots that for some on some of these images you can see, those are called bundle scars. And they're kind of like where the, the vessels of the twig are attached to the leaf so that you have food and resources moving down into the tree's system. And when that leaf falls off, it leaves those scars um, inside that leaf scar that sometimes can be an ID characteristic. Just as we talked about leaves being attached opposite, buds are opposite or alternate or world. Um, all of those characteristics that we introduced under leaves falls into the same thing here. You know, here's your leaf scar, here's your bud, a lateral bud for next year's growth, your terminal bud, your lateral buds sit here, here's your leaf scar. Um, so those characteristics all carry through, even though at this point we're talking um, more like a winter ID with no leaves in sight. So terminal buds, the one on the left is yellow poplar or tulip tree and kind of has a duckbill shaped terminal bud. Here's where the leaf was attached and all those little dots in there are bundle scars. So the outer ring is the outer edge of the leaf scar. And then the dots that you can see inside are the bundle scars. So here's a white oak with a cluster of buds at the tip. You can see here's a leaf scar where the leaf was attached your buds alternate up and down the tree. And then this last one on the right is actually one of them that we call a false terminal bud. Um, and when I get to a different image, I'll go into more detail on that false terminal because it's a little easier to explain with the other image. So these are all oaks. They all have a cluster of terminal buds. How many are at the tip doesn't really matter. It's just multiples. And the one thing I will say, though, that those that fall into the white oak group, their buds at the tip are typically more rounded, just like the lobes on their leaves are, than for the red oak group, which this center one is. You can see these buds are much longer and more pointy. Um, and this is actually, yes, a red oak versus, um, let's see, white oak on the left, swamp white oak in the upper right, and in the lower right, is bur oak. So here's this false terminal. So what happens with a tree that produces a false terminal bud is the tree is growing along during the season. And then all of a sudden, instead of continuing to grow up and produce the next set of buds, 
it's like, oh, it's winter time or it's getting ready for winter time and we're gonna just die back to the last lateral bud we set. So if this had kept growing, this would just be another lateral bud. But what happens is here the tree died back and this is an elm, died back and this little twig here will fall off eventually. And you'll think of this as a terminal bud but it actually was probably going to be a lateral bud and just became a terminal, a false terminal bud by circumstances. So something to think about, there are only a few species out there, elm being one of those that's um, very good at doing these false terminal, making a lateral bud into a false terminal bud. These are also lateral buds. And in this case, you can kind of see there's a zigzag pattern down the twig. Um, this is pretty distinctive for sycamore. So when you look at a sycamore twig, I mean, even look in the background, they all have that zigzag um, as the lateral buds work their way up the twig. Bud scales. So bud scales are the material that's covering, you know, the terminal bud or the lateral buds, and it's going to open up in the spring when the tree starts to grow. Um, I wish I had the picture that um, one of our county educators sent me years ago. Um, it looked, it was a hickory that had these side bud scales had peeled open and they had kind of a pink color to them. So it looked like a flower, but it literally was just those bud scales where they had peeled back to open up and allow the growth to start. Um, so it wasn't a flower, which is what the educator thought. And understandably so with the way the picture was and everything, um, but it was a bud scale. And so some of them, as you can see, are, you can see multiple scales. Some of them aren't quite as distinctive and some of them are just very soft when it comes to bud scales. And the reality here, all three of these are hickories. So no commonality when it comes to looking at what the buds look like. So on your left, is this with a sulfur yellow or school bus yellow, however you want to describe it. That's bitternut hickory. In the center is pignut hickory. And then on the right is shagbark hickory. So very distinctive buds if you're trying to look at um, and figure out what hickory you think you have. Flower buds are different um, than our leaf buds. And in this case, I've got a couple um, here on the right-hand side. This is flowering dogwood. We saw it in a previous image. This water tower shaped, or some folks call it like, like a pumpkin sitting on a fence post. This is very distinctive. This is where the flower for flowering dogwood come. And on the left, this is pawpaw. And so this little brown powder puff here is the flower bud for pawpaw. You can see um, the leaf scar. You can see the um, bud scales in between there. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's just some really distinctive characteristics sitting on this twig for pawpaw. Leaf scars, bundle scars. Um, we were just talking a little bit about that. So the one on the left is ash white ash, um, and the one on the right is black walnut. Very distinctive leaf scars, very distinctive bundle scars. You know, this almost looks like a face. I've had some folks say it looks like ET. Whatever it looks like to you, you can use that to help you ID. Um, but again, they're characteristics that are there kind of in the winter time mostly um, to help you ID different species. Some more bundle scars. So these are actually, the left-hand side is black gum and the right-hand side is sweet gum. Both of them have these three distinct bundle scars. There aren't too many other species that you're gonna see that on that you would come across. And so again, a key characteristic that if you get down to that point and that's what you're looking at, you're looking at one of these species. Pith is usually one of those that I tell folks, man, I hope you never have to get down to that detail. 
Um, the easiest one is black walnut, which is on the right hand side with that chambered pith. So if you take a twig and you take a knife and you kind of slice down until you get to the center of the twig and you see those chambers um, that are that dark color, then you're looking at black walnut. Over on the left hand side is shingle oak with kind of that yellowish color solid in the twig and diaphragmed as you can see those little spongy patches in there. So something like mulberry will have diaphragmed pith. But I hope you don't have to get to that point because that really means you've been stumped on some of the other characteristics that for all three of these um, should be a little more distinctive than having to get down to the pith. Twig color and texture. Um, some have very distinctive. So when I think about green twigs, there's two trees that come to mind. Uh, one would be something like um, sassafras and the other would be box elder. Now the difference between the two, sassafras is gonna have alternate branching and box elder is gonna be opposite. And so if you look at the picture on the left, you can see its branching pattern is alternate. It alternates up and down the twig. If you've got that and you still aren't 100% certain, scratch the twig. It's one of our scratch and sniff trees. You'll have that sassafras, that lemony smell come right out at you if you, you kind of take your thumbnail and scratch down through that bark. On the right hand side is actually a young twig on a um, sweet gum tree with that dark kind of quirky, I'm trying to think of some other descriptors, but it's just a very rough bark for a twig that is so small, small, so young, probably, you know, a third year or a fourth year twig. You can kind of see the newer growth to the back. Um, not all of them will have this quirky growth, but if you see it, it's pretty distinctive when you're looking and it's going to be sweet gum. Lenticels and hairs. So these all three are from the same group. They're all sumac. Um, if you look here, you can see that the leaf scar encircles the bud. So that means when this thing's in leaf, the buds are actually hidden in the base of the petiole for the tree. So you're gonna have to snap leaves off to ensure that that's the bud that you're looking for. Um, you can see the one on the right is incredibly hairy. That's also a great um, distinctive characteristic for this one. So if we go across from left to right, you're looking at smooth sumac with that kind of, if you had it in your hands, it would feel like it was waxed. It's that smooth feeling. Um, and then on the right, you have what we call staghorn sumac. So I always tell folks, think about, you know, a stag, a buck, and their velvet it has that hairy velvet on their antlers. That's kind of what you, I relate to when I think about staghorn sumac with the hairy twigs. Um, and then in the center, we have uh, winged sumac. And so a little bit different species than the other two, but still has the lenticels, the little dots that you can see up and down the tree, um, still has buds that are buried in the base of the petiole. Um, so there's a lot of similarities, but that these twigs are all um, very distinctive when it comes to doing ID for sumac. Thorn spines and spur shoots. So different trees have different characteristics. Spines are um, typically what we think of here. Um, this actually is a hawthorn and hawthorn typically are single thorn, um, but in this case, I have a hawthorn at the edge of the woods that actually has multiple thorns. And so it's a multi-branch thorn, like we'd think maybe on um, a mature honey locust. So these are characteristics that you can always kind of pull out and look at and try to, you know, define. But I will tell you, I also have a hawthorn in the woods that has no thorns. And sometimes when we do our tree ID classes, I'll take the sample from the no thorn one, just because it's a potential um, to see if you can come up with what it is without having such a distinctive characteristic. So here on the, the left is honey locusts. 
that's a native traditional honey locust, unlike what we end up with in our landscapes that are thornless. Um, and then on the right hand side, those paired, sometimes they're called paired spines or paired thorns, that's actually black locusts. And sometimes they're not that large, they can be very tiny on some trees. And so it, it just depends on the tree and the genetics that you're looking at. Do a little bit of bark. Um, I always tell folks that if you get to the point where you're really good at bark, then you're gonna be able to ID trees 365 days out of the year. So the one on the left is black cherry. Um, in college, we called it uh, burnt potato chip or burnt cornflake like bark usually pretty dark, almost black in some cases. Um, the one on the right is Kentucky coffee tree with those kind of cinnamon, orangey colors in between some of the strips of bark. Um, this is a relatively young one, or it was when I took the picture. It's not so young anymore. Here you have one on the left um, that if I showed you all the D-shaped exit holes on it, you would probably then be able to tell me that it's an ash. Um, and the one on the right is one of our scratch and sniff trees. So that's sassafras. And even when you're dealing with the bark, you could take a knife to the bark and scrape and you'll still get that lemony smell that you get from sassafras. Um, but a couple of different, somewhat distinctive between each other, but I could see how some folks could mix them up if they weren't sure what they were looking at. These are the two buckeyes that we were talking about earlier. Um, on the left, we're talking Ohio buckeye. And on the right, we're talking yellow buckeye. And here it's a little easier to see that the yellow buckeyes are a little bit larger um, and typically more in a pod than you'll see in Ohio. The fruit on the left is actually from yellow poplar or tulip tree. Um, we were down in the woods with some SENR students last Saturday. We were down in the sugar bush and we've got some yellow poplar down there that, you know, these fruit pods are standing up there in the stark sunlight. Um, easy to ID this time of year. And the seeds that you can kind of see starting to peel off there were all over the ground in the woods. And then you have the one on the right, kind of a small, spiny, um, but very tasty fruit inside. Wild turkey love them. The birds and the squirrels will strip them usually faster. Um, they leave the pod on the tree. So when the pod starts to open up, the wildlife go after the fruit. And most of the time, if you're walking up to a tree, the pods are all empty because they've all had their fruit snatched out of the pods, but that's American beach. As I said, there you can tell like the ash and the maples apart from their fruit. Here's three ash seeds. So black, green, and white, as you go from left to right, I wouldn't want to have to ID them from the seeds, but you can if you have to. Bur oak in the hairy capped acorn picture and down at the bottom is a more of a traditional, the true white oak. So very different looking. Um, acorns are actually a great way to tell the oaks apart. If you can get to the acorns before the wildlife can, um, you're probably looking at a better, more precise ID by using the acorns than you are any other characteristic of the tree because the genetic basis for the tree typically shows itself in the acorns. And so if I can find those, I'd much rather be able to ID a tree from the acorns. And like I said, there are some keys out there that will help you do that. On the left, we have a flower that flowers at a time when none of us think about anything flowering, which is witch hazel. And depending on the variety, of witch hazel that you're looking at. This was a variety that was at Dawes Arboretum. You can kind of see the white in the background. There was actually snow on the ground and this would have been in late February, I think when we did a tree planting workshop. 
And so depending on the variety of witch hazel, um, you'll have flowers at times that you just aren't used to having flowers on trees and shrubs. And then on the right hand side is sometimes the flower that no one ever sees. Um, this is the flower on yellow poplar or tulip tree, tulip poplar, whichever common name you're used to calling it. Um, many times they're just all up in the very top of the canopy. And all you ever know from them being there are the petals as they fall off and not quite understanding where they're coming from. Um, so while it's, a, it's called poplar, it's actually in the magnolia family, which you can kind of see here if you pay attention to the flower. Redbud. So redbud's unique in the bloom um, because it can have blooms on the trunk and all the way out the stems. Most trees and shrubs flower out at the tip of the twigs. Redbud can flower just about anywhere on the tree, um, which makes it a very unique um, specimen plant when it's in full bloom. So on the left, you have flowering dogwood, and on the right, you have pawpaw. So a lot of times we walk past pawpaw flowers when they're blooming in the woods because they're hanging upside down. So when they're hanging upside down, you're not seeing this part of the bloom, and they just kind of blend in with everything because um, they're on the outside, they are a very dark color. And unless you're looking for them or used to seeing them, it's easy to just walk right past them. But beautiful flowers um, eventually, hopefully, um, yielding pawpaw fruit. A couple of other flowers that I sometimes get phone calls about. So on the left hand side, this is an oak in flower. And a lot of times when there's heavy flowers, my phone rings because folks are complaining about the worms that are hanging from their tree. Um, but I could ask you white oak group or red oak group. And if you look very closely, there are tiny acorns sitting here on the stem. So this means these guys have been on there a year already. They were part of last year's flowers. So you're looking at one of the red oaks, which one at this point would be hard to tell, but you've got at least a couple of acorns sitting here ready to, to grow that year. The one on the right is red maple. Very showy when it bursts out into flower, um, but it's like I, have, I was talking to a maple producer today and some of our silver maple are starting to bloom but we're gonna have some pretty cold temperatures Saturday. So are we gonna lose the blooms and therefore lose the seeds? Um, we'll see what Saturday does to the growth on some of these trees. And last but not least, form. And these would be the trees that my dendrology professor in college would call 60 mile an hour trees. He'd challenge us while we were driving up 71 to go home for the weekend. We should be able to identify some of these trees um, from some distinct characteristics. And this is a very old image, obviously, but it's an American elm. So it has that vase shape. And to this day, he's very right. There's almost a perfect specimen um, north on 71, up around um, one of the outlet, um, I'm trying to think which one, north of Mansfield, north of Ashland, there's on the side, the edge of the highway is a American elm with that very typical vase shape. I've been going past it, you know, for the last five, six years, trying to figure out where can I stop and take that picture without getting run over by all the folks on 71. So I think it's a two person job that we're gonna have to do one day because I don't see any way of being able to pull over somewhere and get out and take that picture um, without ending up in trouble or some kind of situation I don't wanna be in. So this is one that's probably not as distinctive but this is Catalpa. And if you look closely at the photo, you can see all those cigar shaped pods hanging from the tree. But you can also see that it has kind of a gnarled, twisted look. And if you think about it, its branching pattern is whirled. So three stems 
at one node. And that creates this kind of twisted, gnarly looking shape to it um, that is also very distinctive. And then location, location, location. As I said earlier, um, location is great when you're in a native stand of trees, but if you're trying to ID something that someone has planted, all bets are off because we put trees where we want them and not necessarily where mother nature uh, wants them to grow. And so, you know, it becomes a challenge at that point. And I tend to throw location out if there's any thought that the tree was planted um, because it's just not worth thinking about a location because most folks don't, I mean, like I said, I have a pin oak and a swamp white oak in the yard and I didn't plant them there because I had water that I needed them to be part of. Um, so it, you know, even I violate the location rule when I planted my trees in the landscape and we just kind of have to check that one off the list in those kind of scenarios. So with that, that's your woody plant ID for tonight.